So first, can I just say what an incredible privilege it is to be asked to address this group of people who, between you, have hundreds of years of experience of thinking about children in different ways. And um, the title that I chose, Putting Children at the Center of the Digital World, is because that is what we must do. We need to change from their being survivors of a world built for adults to claiming their rightful place as beneficiaries of the digital world. Now, some of my remarks are going to allude to concepts in which many of you are experts, and I am not. Um, as, as we've heard, I spent many years as a film director and the last decade as a legislator. And as such, I actually come to you fresh from the battle of the online safety bill, which happily after six years in the making passed its final legislative hurdle yesterday. So in a matter of weeks, we'll become law. So my intention in stepping rather gingerly into your world is not really to expose my own lack of expertise, so be kind to me when it comes to questions, uh, but rather to point a spotlight on the huge relevance of yours, a relevance that has been largely overlooked in designing digital products and services, and the very thing that we now need to harness if we are to put children at the center of the digital world. So, childhood is the word that we use to describe the journey from dependence to autonomy, infancy to maturity. And while different individual children and different per have different personal, social, and economic circumstances, all of which impact hugely on that journey, we have, over time, established an understanding of this transition in terms of childhood norms, childhood needs, that make up a series of childhood development milestones. Now, as most of you already know, it's widely understood that a milestone is an age, or more commonly, an age range by which certain maturities and understandings are likely to be achieved. But important for our conversation today, they are also an age or an age range where certain maturities and understandings are unlikely or not supposed to be in place. So while a, child, while a child at three to five may be beginning to understand that others feel differently from them, they are not yet able to critically evaluate that information and will take what they're told more or less at face value. And it's not until the age of 13, 15 that a child will develop a heightened sensitivity of risk. And while at that age, some will embrace risk and some will shrink, but until that age, they are unlikely to anticipate or perhaps even notice it. It is our understanding of these physical, neurological, and emotional changes that take place during childhood that has shaped society's response to children. And although in most parts of the world, we take the view that parents and those with parental responsibility offer the first line of both care for and defense of children, we have also concluded that children by virtue of their age and the vulnerabilities associated with age require a broader set of inputs, privileges, and protections beyond those offered by their immediate family. These inputs include a complex but widely understood and respected set of social norms, educational frameworks, advisory bodies, regulatory interventions, and national and international laws. Now, outside the US, the most recognized expression of our common understanding of the rights and privileges of childhood is the UN's Charter of the Rights of the Child. It's the most ratified treaty in the world with 196 signatories, and the US is a glaring exception, frustrating as it is also the country home to most tech companies. Nonetheless, the UNCRC provides a conceptual and practical framework for the notion that the state 
holds responsibilities to children. In addition to children's rights, we design and mitigate for childhood in multiple ways across all aspects of society. We educate, we consider, we consider pediatric medicine to be a distinct speciality and require doctors to obtain additional skills and expertise. We don't criminalize very young children. And in the UK, at least, we impose a public interest test when considering prosecuting older children. We don't allow adults to hold children to contractual obligations. We put traffic calming measures near schools. We rate films according to the ages and stages of childhood. Children have special protections in the labor force. And we make it illegal for kids to smoke, drink, and gamble. And we even take steps to protect them in environments where adults drink, smoke, and gamble. In short, the overriding understanding is that society must, above any other consideration, act in the best interests of the child. This reflects a global consensus that the capacity of a child to understand and act in their own best interest is necessarily limited by the vulnerabilities and immaturities associated with their age. The digital environment is almost unique in failing to reflect that consensus. My involvement in the world of digital tech and kids started somewhat accidentally. For the first 30 odd years, I was a movie director, both here and, uh, here and in the UK. And towards the later part of that film career, I started a charity that uses film to educate and ignite the imagination of school children. And as the charity grew, I was regularly in and out of schools, and I engaged with literally hundreds of children. So when, in 2012, the smartphone became a price point that a parent might give it to a child, I suddenly noticed that all the children around me went quiet. These silent children, poking away at their phones, were no longer just here, but both here and elsewhere. And I wondered what that might mean. And because I was a filmmaker, I made a film <laughs> in real life. And so for a year, I spent hundreds of hours filming in the bedrooms of teenagers, gaming, gambling, watching porn, making music, posting, preening, falling in love, witnessing many things that benefited them and many that didn't. With my camera, I followed the cables from those children's bedrooms under the ocean up into New York to server farms as big as a small town in middle America and then on to Silicon Valley, where I can proudly say I have been kicked out of more HQs than most people. <laughs> the dominant culture of data harvesting does not include uh, sharing their private information with me, it turned out. Anyway, all across America, I interviewed tech leaders and commentators who valorized the democratizing nature of the digital world and explored their fight, their battle against the gatekeepers, including a founding father of the internet who explained to me that the utopian vision of the digital world was that all users would be equal. That sentence changed my life because it's a category error. However good it sounds at first, the truth is, if you treat everyone equally, then de facto you treat a child as if they are an adult. And a child is a child until they reach maturity, not until the moment they reach for their smartphone. Without thinking, we had invented a technology increasingly becoming the organizing technology of society that did not uphold the established rights, privileges, legal frameworks, and protections of childhood. Indeed, it did not recognize the concept of childhood. And I understood in a moment, it was like watching everything go through my mind backwards, that the problems and dilemmas of the children that I had been filming for the last year directly flowed 
from the fact that, that they were being demanding, adult decisions were being demanded of them. Before they have the skills, before they had the experience, and before they had the emotional capacity to make those adult judgments and choices that were being demanded. As a 12-year-old boy said to me once, in the digital world, I'm not allowed to be a kid. I'm just an underage adult. And once I've been an adult, how the hell do you expect me to go back to being a kid offline? The founder's utopian vision of a network of open source smallholders with a train of equally empowered, enabled men, generally at the time, adult participants, had been rapidly replaced by a handful of powerful companies that immediately closed ranks, making the digital environment more powerful, less responsive, more autocratic, and less accountable than the gatekeepers they'd promised to replace. In the same brief time, the one, one in three participants online were under the age of 18, but living online as if they were adults. The move fast and break things culture had failed to anticipate that the digital world would be where much of childhood would play out, which is probably why they never can stopped to consider if some of the things they might break were our children. So one of the most difficult things that parents, legislators, teachers, and children themselves sort of struggle with is identifying exactly what is wrong. Indeed, there's a sort of a pervasive, if a little kind of shameful view that we can leave it till the kids grow up because they understand the tech. So let me quickly kill off the myth of children as digital natives, a term that implies they've grown up in some exotic land which they alone understand and embrace in a manner that we adults never will. It has been many years since the longitudinal study, EU Online, which is now actually Global Kids Online, showed that kids, children, persistently remain on the lowest ladder of digital opportunity. Children spend most of the time on a few highly commercial sites, have the least facility to understand, organize, or use the information they're presented with, while simultaneously having the least experience of and resources to gather information from other sources. An eminent psychologist once said to me, using technology with two fast thumbs cannot in itself be taken as evidence that a child is a creative participant in the digital environment with full literacy, citizenship, and agency. In plain language, just because you can use it doesn't mean that you can control it. This idea that we can let a generation go by before we address the issue is in direct contrast to how we approach the harm to children from any other sector. It accepts and embeds the exceptionalism that the tech sector claims, arguing as they do that it should not be subject to the cultural and regulatory rules of society, even as they look like, operate like, and make money like other corporate entities. It is Silicon Valley's army of lobbyists who would have us believe that while we're in a moral panic, the kids are ahead of the game. On the contrary, the kids are the pawns in the game. A child that has agency has the ability to make choices based on information that's been provided in a way that they can understand in conditions in which that choice is meaningful. And with that in mind, let me list a bundle of technological methods used to capture and hold attention online particularly pervasive on gaming, streaming, and social networks where children spend the bulk of their time. This bundle, variously referred to as sticky, addictive, reward loops, dark patterns, manipulative design, was first listed for me by the head of IT of a major mobile phone company who referred to it as captology, the science of capturing a person's attention by keeping them in rapture which can include 
soft rhythmic sounds or music to block out real life, sharp narrative sounds to pull users' attention to what's happening on the screen, bright intense light that vibrates intermittently at high speed, cycles of intense activity followed by slow end like changing an avatar, responding to a message or being congratulated, only to be interrupted by something fast and intense to drag the user back just as they're ready to quit. This, she explained, is because if you think you're getting off but come back at the last minute, you stay longer than if you're attached for a single exhausting session at the same pace. Vibrating design, uh, devices, confirmation signals from peers, heart, like, share, random notifications from algorithms that feel your waning activity, personal streaks not breaking a run, irrespective of the value in the exchange, community streaks, not breaking a run with someone else so that you're not guilty or embarrassed, irrespective of your desire to be in contact with that person. Creating false scarcity or time limits, updating new, urgent, or partially hidden information, attracting your attention with a keyword or image that you've just used in another setting, attracting your attention with an extreme word or powerful image, attracting your attention by showing you that others in your circle are online, getting more attention, posting more. The color blue. This list, although absolutely exhausting, is not exhaustive. And the impact of this rapture is non-trivial. It is the technology behind tech tantrums, lost time, colloquially known as doom scrolling, <laughs> sleepless nights, diverted attention, compulsive behavior, gaming diapers, that is, for the uninitiated, the incontinence diapers you put on so you don't have to get up to go to the toilet while you're playing a game. And a whole lot of conflict. In 2017, tech-related conflict rose to the top cause of causes of familial discord in the UK, and it has stayed there ever since. The UNCRC in Article 1 says a child is a person under the age of 18. But the tech sector has presided over a system in which the age of adulthood is set at 13 and practiced willful blindness to tens of millions of children much younger. These children, not yet fully formed, do not have the development capacity to resist one or another or a combination of these pulls. The algorithms follow their behavior on such tight loops that they can, in real time, provide an exact personalized mix to keep the child clicking. So if one child is more responsive to image and confirmation from peers, but another responds to sharp sounds and being set challenges, each will get the loop of events that will most entice them to their own personalized state of rapture. These techniques are not unusual, they're industry norms, and they probably are responsible for that sick feeling you have in your own stomach when you pick up your phone and you don't really mean to. But they are especially potent when deployed against children. They deliberately orchestrate a context in which a child cannot make a meaningful choice whether or not to engage, i.e. exercise their right to agency. They are the digital sweet shop, which most certainly has its pleasures, but does not provide a balanced diet. Being stuck in a state of rapture is not in the best interest of a child. And the degree to which a child's language behavior environment can be mirrored and represented to them with no reference to or friction from familial, social, and societal norm is now, with the advent of immersive worlds and increasingly sophisticated AI, almost infinite. With a few prompts, they can change their favorite pop star their gender, they can change them into a child, they can dress them in clothes they want, they can undress them, they can go hang out in an environment of their choice, they can make them say things with their famous voice. But the opposite is also true. 
this hugely powerful experience with no known edges someone can, in friendship, in humor, or with malevolent, malevolent intent, control a child's image, voice, or behavior in private or in the full glare of public gaze. My own personal focus is on the harms created by the design norms of the system, but it is simply a fact that treating children as if they are adults in an advertising-driven business model means that it is in the service provider's interests to give children unfettered access to content irrespective of its suitability. Because in an attention economy, it is keeping the engagement and availability of eyeballs that matters at any cost. And while much is made of children, children accessing adult violent or harmful material, children report that much of that material is thrust upon them rather than searched out. And of course, once it lands on their screen, the rapacious algorithm set to maximize engagement makes sure it keeps on coming at speed, in volume, and at ever increasing extremity. So, children are paying the cost of the vast rewards gained by others elsewhere. So, what should we do? I share the opinion of Professor Sonia Livingston, and I rather, I rather suspect many in this room, that it is inadequate to look at how long children are online. What we should be looking at is what they are doing online, and most crucially, what is being done to them. The digital world is 100% engineered. It could be anything. It does not, in and of itself, have to be bad, risky, unhealthy, negative in any other way. But it has to be designed with children in mind. Almost every aspect of a child's life is mediated by technology. Their education, their entertainment, their social and sexual familial relationships, the information that helps them understand the world around them. And increasingly, it also impacts on their health, their, their emotional state, their diet, even their physical movements. For many years, child development experts have referred to the three agents of socialization, family, school, and peers. The key contributors that instill in the child behaviors and values expect, that define how we live with one another and how they may be as they grow up. Behaviors that get ingrained that define how they are as adults. More recently, the argument has been made that the digital environment is the fourth pillar of socialization. The same digital environment legislated to believe a child is an adult at 13, that a company can provide those same services for children who are underage without penalty, an environment in which the very concept of childhood does not exist. Now, I always want to make utterly clear that the answer is not to kick children out of the digital world. But the commercial environments largely designed for adults that demand significant levels of interaction and normalize the spread of personal information and supercharge outrageous popular and shrill material are not environments for children to spend the bulk of their time. Because children are emerging sleepless, anxious, overexpose, and we need to design the world for them. Over the last 10 years, myself and colleagues in Parliament, in Five Rights Foundation, and in the Digital Futures Commission have drafted a general comment formally adopted by the Council on the Rights of the Child that sets out how states should interpret their responsibilities to children in relation to the digital world. We have as was uh, said, introduced the Age Appropriate Design Code, a standalone data protection law in the UK which prompted radical changes to the design of many digital products, such as the introduction of Safe Search as a default by Google, disabling adult users' private messaging to children on TikTok and Instagram, preventing adult apps from being downloaded from the Play Store by children under 18. 
and hundreds of other similar things. As the law comes into maturity, we anticipate in the next few months regulatory action which will further drive design change. And as I trailed at the beginning, the UK Online Safety Bill has a new set of requirements to protect and enhance children's online experience. These initiatives, alongside those in other jurisdictions, are aimed to bring an end to the era of tech exceptionalism. And when I get to the end, which I shortly will, I'd be very happy to answer any detailed questions about the potential impact of any of the above, and also on yesterday's court decision to block similar initiative in California. But in these final moments, I wanted to return to you and your expertise by saying this. A couple of months ago, I talked to a large group of Canadian teenagers. And as we talked, it emerged that I had been the architect of the law that had resulted in TikTok stopping notifications after 9 p.m. for 15-year-olds and 10 p.m. for 16 and 17-year-olds. And a young man leapt to his feet, grabbed the microphone from the, uh, from the MC, and went on a very eloquent, I have to say, rant, <laughs> but eloquent nonetheless, about how that design change had changed his sleep, his concentration, his grades. And as he spoke, all the other young people in the, in the room stood up one by one and gave him an ovation. Now, I don't tell you this to bask in the glory, although I have to say it was one of the high points of my entire life, so <laughs> make what you will out of that. Um, but, but to say this, in this room, there are many of you that will have an extraordinary detailed understanding of what sleep means to a teenager's emotional and physical well-being. Indeed, I met one such person while I was waiting to speak. There are others who might prefer to think about the young man's lack of agency and what feelings he might have about having been unable to resist the call of something he had seen doing him harm, but he could not resist. And yet more of you might be considering how busy childhood is and how unreasonable the hold that TikTok had on this young boy and how it represents an opportunity cost of physical, educational, social, and other experiences. And maybe someone else is thinking about the Harvard uh, work that showed that a teacher can only teach at the rate of the tiredest person in the class. So everybody else in that young man's class was suffering from his sleeplessness. The logic of fixing the digital world for kids is not a mystery. It flows directly from what all of you already know. Your understanding of what conditions children and young people need, and then seeing what the features of technology get in the way of that need. The solutions lie in rebalancing the asymmetry of arms between an individual kid in their bedroom trying to deal with a complex task of growing up, while the most powerful companies in the world are hawking their attention in ever smaller, smaller fractions of a second to ever more millions of buyers with increasingly sophisticated pulls that create uncertainty and perpetual competition in young people. The persistent idea that each new era of technology is ahead of what we understand is part of the deliberate narrative to exempt the sector from regulatory or moral responsibility. And while we do have different legal systems and regulatory environments, I can assure all of you who are US citizens that the safety by design measures being pursued in Europe are no more than industry norms of any other sector, i.e. they require products to be safe for the consumer. And companies are now being forced to do work to comply. 
a different digital world is possible. And it is the work of people in this room that explain what children need that will help people like me put it into law in the way that we are now doing in Europe. And, and I want to really emphasize what I was saying at the beginning about the role of the state, because it is a stark fact that not every child has an engaged parent. Not every child has a loving parent, not every child has a parent at all, which is one of the reasons that society must play a part. In the 21st century, children need and want access to the digital world, but they need it on new and improved terms. Those terms must reflect corporate responsibility and the stages of development and put demands on children that are appropriate to their age. And above all, they must give them agency, meaningful choice in an environment that is responsive to, respectful of, their full complement rights and needs of children. Now, many times in the last decade, I get to the end of a speech like this, and the first question is, what services are okay for kids, or how long they should be online? And I do not, spoiler alert, do not have the answers for those questions, but I would suggest that they are actually impossible to answer. What I hope you find your dis yourselves discussing over the next few days is what fundamental needs children have at different stages of childhood and how the services and products that they are using need to adapt to meet those needs. Until it is an industry norm to develop products to meet children's needs, then the billion children online are simply clickbait, toiling in the fields of Silicon Valley. It should not be left to children, or indeed parents, to adapt to a digital world designed for adults but rather we must build the digital world that children and young people deserve. One algorithm at a time, anything less is an erosion of childhood itself. And I repeat, this is a 100% engineered world. It can be anything it wants to be. I want to thank you for all that you have done and I want to thank you for all that you are going to do. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I cut my speech. So okay. So there is a, a little bit of time. I think it would be lovely if you yeah. took questions. Of so course. please. Yes. Does anyone have a question? Go on, some brave person, put your hand up. No? Thank you. So, of the tech leaders that you interviewed, who did you find to be the most morally admirable? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's even more difficult than the other questions I can't answer. Um, do you know what, I've met quite a lot of tech leaders on the journey, and I've met um, a lot of people who, who work in the tech industry, and I would say the people I find most morally admirable uh, are the engineers. And that is a re it's been a really interesting thing, but the policy makers just, they talk you down. The, the, the government affairs people, they just you know spend 55 minutes of any hour telling you how great they are. Uh, but the engineers are sort of geared to solving problems. And I have had the very great privilege of talking to a number of engineers and a number of all the companies that you can imagine, and you've all got on your phone, and, and talking about really detailed A-B problems. And they actually understand 
the language that I'm speaking. They understand best interest, just like they understand sticky. You know, when, when lawmakers say best interest of the child, that's really difficult, because what does that mean and how can we conceive it? Well, how do, how do you conceive sticky? Actually, the way these things are designed are very A, B, A, B, A, B. And so you come to a decision, you go, is that good for kids or is that not so good for kids? Not good, let's go B. Is that good for kids? And actually, those guys, are really clear, they can design anything. It's at the C-suite level, it's also all our pensions, let's face it, it's, it's, it's the money um, that has to set the tone. And I do think, uh, you know, I do think, and I have had absolute experience of this, which is, you know, passing legislation, regulation, it's not a panacea, but what it does is it puts it higher up the intrigue. Congratulations on the success of the legislation. What is your next challenge? <laughs> so, um, and thank you, by the way. Thank you. Um, I, I have a very particular... I, w I work in a number of countries with my colleagues. Um, obviously, I have a role in the UK Parliament, and so the next absolute direct challenge is that we have a data bill coming through, and I want to make sure that they don't water down the GDPR. Now we've had Brexit, so, so that's an interesting thing. Um, and I think that uh, there's a little bit of unfinished work because I got in one piece of the online safety bill, um, I, I uh, managed to get an amendment that means that coroners will be able to access material that children were looking at uh, before, in the case of a deceased child. Um, that's been a huge issue in, in the UK, and I've been involved in a number of really tragic cases and put together a group of, of uh, bereaved families for online safety, and, uh, and they absolutely campaigned alongside me. So there's a little bit uh, of work there. But my real challenge, and I, and I say mine, our real challenge, is that if it is this hard in places with institutions and infrastructure and research communities and activists and funded NGOs, how hard is it in the global south, right? And there is 2.6 billion people still not online. They are coming online very quickly and the vast majority of them are under 18. Yeah? So a lot of the work that I now do is actually on the African continent, in Asia, and so on, and really trying to kind of give ready-made sort of ideas and policies that have been tried out elsewhere and then help them move it into their context. And that is my personal piece of, piece of the next piece of the journey. In the area of taking the information that all the researchers have come up with and translating that to the families yeah. and, and the individual, like in the homes, how does it look? In terms of trying to encourage the support of the online safety bills and the safety corporate design code, I need to know. I've received questions: Who wrote this? Um, who wrote the policy? Where is that coming from? Because we're so glad it's there, but. How do we know if it's really total best case or not? Um, so that way I can encourage them to, it's, whatever it is, is better than what it currently is. <laughs> I think you answered your own question there. Um, I, th I, I, th I, I absolutely understand, and I think that one of the things that I tried to do in this speech by listing all those tiny little increments that keep people on is to help understand that what we have to do is get in the way of those increments. And, and there is a coalition of children's charities here. Um, I will make sure that, that, that that their contact details is available to everybody in this room in the course of, in the course of the uh, Congress, um, that will answer questions and will explain uh, things. But I think from my perspective, when I speak to families who say, this is bigger than any one child, any one family, there's an asymmetry of power, it's as if you've got all the faucets running and you're running around the house trying to you know, turn them off while someone else is turning them on. So actually, 
what we have to do is put your voice, you know, you do the best you can for your family and there are things you can do, obviously, but, you know, you have to add your voice uh, and make it a political imperative. And I, and I think that's very exhausting for people with kids in trouble and people with kids at all. You know, it's just an exhausting time of life. But we do need parents' voices. Uh, and we also, can I just say, need young people's voices. And the, um, the, the people who ran the campaign in California to get the California Age Appropriate Design Code, uh, when, when, uh, the, when the senators and, 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 and the state you know, this, the state politicians were about to take it down to 16. There was a young group of people who said, hang on a minute, what about us? They're called Design for Us, and they said, we're 16, we're 17. This is ludicrous. Why are we not being protected? And it is arguable that, um, the, apart from the very young children, uh, they are the most vulnerable because they, you know, they are most out there, least supervised, uh, experimenting in their lives uh, and and it's a very very difficult time but they're not yet adult so it was their voices uh, and I think I hope that's helpful to you to say to families actually young people want a little bit of uh, you know guardrails and and protection on their own terms but but nonetheless yeah um, as someone that just has a very important about have you identified uh, important or, or large gaps in, in research that could inform some of these regulations? Um, that's a great question. And funnily enough, um, I was asked it in a political meeting this morning, and I said that I was going to write to them. So I don't know how to write to you, but I will. Um, I, off the top of my head, I think that there is a big gap in the early years. I think people are not thinking about what it really means to be babysat um, by devices, but more importantly, I think they're not thinking quite enough about what it's like to be babysat by people who are on their devices. And I'm not saying that no one's doing it, and I can see some heads nodding, and I hope that means you're in the middle of it. Um, but I think as a politician, as a legislator, I'm not hearing it loud and clear, the evidence. I think the other thing that I'm, is, is a slight segue, but I kind of like to get it into your conversation for the week, is I think this whole kind of AI debate right now is another way of shiny, new, and so on. It's not artificial, it's not intelligent, it's computational, and it's very, very, very big and expensive to run, and it is going to further narrow the people of power, yeah? Um, but we have to think about, we have to think about AI in development, you know, how it hits against development. So what I was trying to say there when I was describing that you can make anything, anybody anything, that's very, very problematic for children. So I think looking at what it's like to have no boundaries at all, yeah, is, is both what adults do to children um, and how the AI learns and guesses is very problematic. Um, I had one conversation with the police recently, because um, I do some work in the, you know, with, with the police, uh, you know, who are looking for perpetrators. It's not the core of my work, but, but I do it. And they were talking about a program that so often had been used to say, woman, and then, you know, to make a picture of a woman, and then blonde, and then big boobs. Sorry, that's English, breasts, yeah? And it had learned that big boobs was coming after woman, so it missed woman. So when you said woman, it just did big boobs. Now, just it's really a funny story, but the implications of that are that woman is lost to the language. That is very, very concerning. Yeah. So I think that the way we have to think about AI is how it guesses. The thing about AI is it is formally there to make leaps, 
based on an incredible amount of knowledge, but that knowledge can be trained in ways that are very, very complicated. So I think, you know, looking at AI not as a shiny thing, and don't please go down some good, some bad. You know, we just want good. That's fine. We're, we're happy with good. Um, and, uh, and, and this early years thing, I think, really concerns me. But I, I am thinking about it more broadly. What do you think it would take for uh, child protections like the age-appropriate design code to pass in the law in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> I am an English person on American soil. <laughs> um, you know, I was really pleased that California passed it. I think that Maryland and Minnesota are going to give it a go. There was uh, the court decision, and I say this very carefully, and please, you know, just as a non-pro in this environment, but I was really interested that in, in the court decision in California, it wasn't marginal, it was absolute. And what it said was that, that corporations... Uh, First Amendment rights are greater than child safety, and that Google has every right to be in your child's bedroom, and that TikTok owns your child's data, your child doesn't. But if you look deeply at it, I think it also weirdly would historically make copper, which has been around for 23 years, um, uh, unconstitutional. It'll certainly make COSA <laughs> unconstitutional. Um, so I think that, that there will be a long road on that. And I think it's not my fight, but other people will fight it. Um, so I can't answer your question about what it will take. But I do think that all of you are part of the conversation because what I was trying to say here is people don't really understand that we know the answer. They think we're waiting for the answer. You guys have the answer. The answer is if you can't develop properly as a child, you can't find those circumstances because something's banging at you, then remove the thing that's hitting you, right? And, and a lot of what we want from tech is just disabling some of the 2.0 things. There was nothing wrong with tech 1.0. And you, is that a stop? Thank you.